Welcome to Gateway Church Wirral Online. We're so delighted that you're with us this morning. So great that you can be a part of our live streamed gathering. Just to welcome you to this space and what we're all about. Um, to say that we as a church, we're all about seeing people meet with God, encounter him for all his goodness and his grace and for lives to be changed by him. As a church, we want to see a world transformed, made better and better through every life transformed by the grace of God. So our hope and our prayer for you today, meet with Jesus in the things that we're saying, in the things that we're singing, in the way that we're opening up the word of God, which is alive for us today. We want you to know Jesus, know that he loves you, know that he has a plan for your life. And as we're going through our gathering this morning, do please connect with us here in this live stream space. You can fill in our connection card, the tab I think is at the top of your screen. Request prayer if you'd like to. There are great friendly people who would love to pray with you. And do just connect with us in any and every way that you'd love to. As a church, we gather. That's what we're about today. When we come to the close of our gathering, I'll tell you how you can connect with us going forward into the week. So have a really great time. Be blessed. Enjoy yourself and enjoy Jesus we pray. Good morning. It's lovely to see you here this morning. Thank you for joining us. If you're online it's great to have you with us as well. We've got an exciting morning. I know it's half term and some families are away but we're still going to have lots and lots of fun. It's our family service. So would you like to stand with us and Oba's going to open in prayer. Thank you Lord for the things you're doing in our lives. Thank you that we are alive and well. Thank you for gathering us here today and for the children who have finished this half term. Sorry for the things we do wrong and please forgive us. Please help everyone to be blessed by the service. Amen. 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 Let's worship. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I see 
was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Just when you call my name. I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Into your glorious name. You call my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Into your glorious name.
precious blood of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to know that he is our cornerstone, that he is our rock, and that we can trust in him? Would you like to take your seats? Now I'm going to invite all the kids to come down to the front. Come and get your seats down here for me. Okay. Have you got any children? Where are we going? Come on then. Come run down for me. Okay. We're going to have a little bit of fun this morning. I'm just going to get shaken. Don't worry. You're not going to get... Do you want to take a seat? On there. Fantastic. Okay. So let me ask you a question. Okay. Where... Do you find love? Where do you find love? Sorry, say a bit louder. In your heart? Fantastic. You find love in your heart. Anywhere else you might find love? What do you think? Go on, just so do you answer all the questions today. And other people? And in relationships? Oh, these are good answers, aren't they? In your heart, in other people, in relationships. So, if I said to you, this is love, does it look like love? Why not? It's a spray can. It's a spray can. Okay. If I said this represented love, is that a little bit better? If I say that this represents love. Now... If this is love in a can, okay, is it any good? What do you think? No? Why is it no good? It's not going anywhere, okay? It's not going anywhere. It's stuck in the can. And we can be full of love, can't we? So hopefully this works. Okay, so that's us, and that's us full of love. Is that good? Yes? Is it fantastic? No. It's good, but it's not fantastic, is it? Because that is love inside of us. What does it need to do? Anybody know? It needs to fill out of us, doesn't it? So if I keep going like this. Oba's moving back here. (laughs) It looks a little bit like an ice cream, doesn't it? Is it going? Is it going? Oh. Should we go like that? You see, love, doesn't it, needs to be shared. Yes? It's no good being stuck in a can. Now, if, if you ask your dads or your grandparents, your granddads, okay, some of them might shave. Yes? Have you seen them shave at all? This is shaving foam. Some of them do, or some of them have beards where they're thick and bushy. But if they don't use, okay, the can, and they try to shave, have any of you seen them cut, maybe, the face? Because it's really rough, and it's not smooth. You see, they need the foam to make it smooth. But it's no good being stuck in here, is it? It has to be used, and it has to be on the outside. And I want us to think about today, about how we can share God's love. How can you share God's love? Because it's half term. Who's looking forward to half term? There's a couple of kids. Parents are like, really? Is it half term? You know. It's half term. Have you got anything planned? Ah, so you're going out. Bouncy castles, hot dogs. Oh, this is sounding good. Okay, we've got bouncy castles and hot dogs. Are you doing anything else this week? Would you might maybe go to the park? Anybody going to play football? You're not going to play football? You're going to play football? You see, what I want us to think about is how we can share God's love. It's no good us having God's love inside of us and not doing anything about it. It's like this can, it's no good having the contents inside unless 
it comes out. So my challenge for everybody this week is to think about how can we share God's love, okay? Every day of this week, when you get up, I was having a conversation with somebody last night, and they said they don't get up till about 12 o'clock in the holidays. And I was like, that is a waste of time. Why do you want to sleep? Why do you really want to sleep? It's a waste of time. But think about, okay, God is love. God loves you. He fills you with love. So we're actually commanded to actually go into all the world and to share God's love. So if any of you can come next week and say to me, Pastor Karen, I've done this, this, and this, I'm going to have a prize for you. Does that sound good? Yeah? It might be chocolate, but it might not survive the week. If Pastor Karen will eat it. So we'll see. But we'll get you a prize. If you can say to me, okay, we are going to share God's love, and this is how I've done it. It could even be, and your parents will love this, tidying your bedroom. (laughs) Or taking the dog for a walk. Well done. Okay, I'm going to invite the band to come back. We want you to get on your feet because we like to get energetic. Okay, that's all of us. So would you like to stand? We're going to do a song called My Lighthouse. There are actions. You're best probably following Grace because I normally go wrong on actions. But do we know this song? Some of the kids know this song. Follow us as we do it. Are we moving that? And in my doubt, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. And in the silence, you won't let go. And in the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, and I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore. Oh, oh, oh. Safe to shore. Hear what tomorrow brings With each morning I'll rise and sing My God's love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness, and I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, and I will trust the promise, but you will carry me safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore, oh, oh, oh. safe to shore. For us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Fire before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Fire before us, you're the brightest. You will lead us through the storm. Fire before us. You're the brightest, you will lead us through the storm. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, 
shining in the darkness and I will follow you oh my lighthouse my lighthouse and I will trust the promise for you will carry me safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore Well done, guys. That was fantastic. And well done, mums and dads, grandparents, everybody here. Would you like to take your seats? Now, of course, it's our family service, so hopefully our children, as they've come in, will have received a pack for them for lots of fun to do there. But also, we do have our family area down in the basement there if you feel they need some space to run around. Now, I'm going to pass over to Ronald. You've got a treat this morning. We've got three of us sharing the word on citizenship and kingdom principles. So, over to you. Thanks. Right, good morning. Um, if you are here in the building, well done. Sometimes it's quite good to stay and have a lie-in in bed and oh, I don't want to go out to bed. If you're on the um, online um, church thing, um, welcome. Uh, it's great that you are able to join us this morning. As Pastor Karen mentioned, you have uh, three of us sharing some thoughts on kingdom citizenship. And we will carry on with our passage from 1 Peter chapter 2. Pastor Greg started off with an introduction from last week. And if we read on verses 9 and 10, we will read these words. Um, you are a chosen people. Just have a look at the person beside you. Tell them you are chosen by God. The God of all creation, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords has chosen you. That's special. And he goes on to say, a royal priesthood. Those two words are important. Royal meaning blue-blooded, someone of a great hierarchy of royalty. But also priesthood. The priesthood signifies a mediator between the people and God. So you have a royal priesthood. You have royal blood flowing from you. The king of kings, remember? So that makes you kings and queens. But also a priesthood, a mediator between people and God. Now hopefully this is making some imagery in your minds. And it goes on to say you are a holy Nation. Oh, come on, Ronald. You're, you're pulling my leg now. How can I be holy? I'm just me. I have my flaws. I'm human. I make mistakes. But God, in you, if you are a follower of Jesus, makes you holy. You don't see yourself anymore as a bumbling, frail person but a, a person that has been touched with God's righteousness, made holy, set apart for his purpose. A holy nation. It means you're not on your own. You are not holy by yourself. You are made holy as part of a wider group of people, a nation. Sometimes when we go through life, we feel that I'm alone here. But it's the song for Liverpool Football Club would go, you'll never walk alone. You are part of a holy nation. This next line is really important. A people for God's own possession. God takes responsibility over you. Why? Because he has you in his hands. He calls you as his own. One, you're not on your own, but more importantly, God is with you, for you. Tell somebody beside you, God is for you. He is not against you, he is for you. He is looking out for you. You are God's possession. What for, Ronald? 
what is this all about? Why am I chosen by God? Why am I called a royal priesthood? Why did he set me apart as a holy nation? Why does he want to have control over my life? To proclaim. Can you say that with me? Proclaim. Come on, children. I know it's half term. <laughs> but to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I don't like the dark. I come from a country when um, growing up we, we had long periods of blackouts. And um, one of the scariest things sometimes as a child is to have the lights go out in the middle of the night. That happened oftentimes. I mean, for my friends here from the Philippines, they could relate. It's not a, a very reassuring thing to be in the dark, not knowing where you are, where things are. And if you have to move around, you are at risk of hurting yourself or somebody else in that dark place. But we are called out of darkness into a small light. No? Um, a, a small sparkle or a, a, a something way beyond. No, it's marvelous. It chases away all the darkness. We are called to, out of darkness, into his marvelous light. To proclaim that wonderful thing. Verse 10 goes on to say, once you were not a people. Meaning you don't have any identity. You don't have any character. You're just going along with how things are around you. There's no clear identity. But now you are a people. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy. And that's a big one. Now, I have two wonderful girls. They're smiling, <laughs> shouting. And I, I love them to bits. Um, but as I mentioned, nobody here is perfect. Anyone here is perfect? Can, can we swap places, take this mic off me and you preach? I'm not perfect myself. They're not perfect themselves. They, they still make me, why did you do that? And by the letter of the law, you could argue oh, they need to be punished. The, the smiles have gone now. I know you have a mask on, but I... <laughs> but no, mercy, grace, unmerited favor is bestowed upon them. Why? Because I love them. I don't say I don't love you anymore because of the mistakes that they make. Because of my love, I extend mercy. I extend grace. I extend goodness and kindness to them because I love them. Imagine now if an imperfect God can do that to their children, how much more the God of all creation who loves us unconditionally beyond our imaginings can do it for you and for me. This is the kind of God that we serve. This is the kind of God that we know. We're talking about kingdom citizenship you are made part of God's kingdom now how is that important verse 11 is an important verse for us to continue on in this passage having known who we are our identity in Christ a royal priesthood a chosen generation a holy nation called out to proclaim the virtues of him who will take us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter now is urging us, and this is important for us this morning. Beloved, I urge you. There's a prompting there. There's an encouragement there. As foreigners and exiles, what does that mean? If you are a part of God's holy nation, a member of the royal priesthood, your citizenship is taken from this world, this literal world, into the kingdom of God. So what that means is our life here on earth is temporary. He has taken us out of being citizens of this world, submitting and going through the pressures, the demands, the expectations of this world, and transferred us into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. 
as foreigners and exiles, not really subjecting themselves to the ways of this world, as foreigners and exiles, as part of God's kingdom, citizens of this eternal kingdom. He urges us to abstain from the desires of the flesh, which war against your soul. Now, I thought they're one and the same. I thought the desires of my flesh are the things that my soul would want. No, but if you are actually a child of God, a member of God's kingdom, God has touched you in your whole being, your body, your soul, your spirit. God does not save only a part of you. God saves all of you and takes all of you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your soul is part of God's kingdom. Now, Peter is saying here, the desires of the flesh, the old person, the old Ronald, the old person who was far from God, wars against this soul that God has touched. The desires of that soul is for God, for God's kingdom. And yet it wars against the desires of the old self. Probably to give us a better picture, um, let me share, give me two minutes, three minutes. Um, we have a celebrity, a sports celebrity back home in the Philippines. I'm, I'm from the Philippines, as you have probably gathered. Um, who here is a boxing fan? Can you, can, ooh, I see hands there. Most are blokes. I, I, don't, I don't blame you. But Manny Pacquiao, the Pac-Man, is the only boxer who has won titles in eight weight divisions. So imagine lightweight, middleweight, bantamweight, heavyweight, in eight divisions. Weight division. So boxing, you, you fight against somebody of the similar weight. Otherwise, a heavyweight will just punch somebody from the lightweight and kill them. That's how brutal boxing is. But this guy is so good. He was once considered one of the best pound-for-pound pound boxer in the world. Eight titles in, uh, titles in eight weight divisions. He actually had 12 titles altogether. He's now 43. He's retired and is running for presidency in the Philippines. I don't know whether it's a wise thing, but that's politics. Let's leave that behind. What I'm saying is this man accomplished what he did because he trained himself. He denied himself of the luxuries of life. He probably trained eight, day, eight hours a day. Had to deny himself from having food, certain foods and have to train well. And this is just for a title that can be taken away from him. For something that is fleeting. That is something that will not last forever. The number of times I'm sure he had to struggle with Oh, here's some chocolate, Manny. In the middle of the training, I'm sure he was offered something like that. I said, no, no, no. I'm aiming for the prize. My eyes are set on things beyond the here and now. If you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, our eyes should be set on things in God's kingdom. Yes, we need food, we need drink. We probably need some of those shapes. I need one. But those are temporal things. A citizen of God's kingdom sets their eyes on things in God's kingdom. Jesus himself went through the same temptations as we do at this time. When he was tempted by the devil, he was tempted concerning the, the desires of the flesh. Turn these rocks into food to bread and to have something to eat. He was tempted on the things that he sees. See these nations, these kingdoms, I will give it to you. He was tempted regarding the pride in, his, in life, in heart. Bow down to me and you, that's all you need to do if you are the son of God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the issues that men and women here and now, you and me, struggle with. If you turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 1, verse 14. 
And this is something that's important for us to understand. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Based on that passage and based on Jesus' experience himself, we could figure out that our greatest enemy is not the devil. It's the desires of our own self. Let's pause for a while. Think about that. The devil did not attack Jesus head on because he knew the outcome would be, no way you're going to be Jesus. It's like Manny Pacquiao, who won titles in the bantamweight division, fighting against Tyson Fury. What do you expect will be the outcome of that? Tyson Fury, by the way, if you don't know, is the heavyweight champion. Okay? A heavyweight fighting a bantamweight is a mismatch. The devil used the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life to tempt Jesus. And that's the way the enemy is tempting Jesus. You and me. Jesus went on to say in Luke chapter 9 verse 23. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. So that's verse 23. If if you have it on screen, please. Chapter 9 verse 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow it. What did it say? Deny himself himself. There are a few more thoughts I'd like to share, but before I hand over to Pastor Karen, I'd like to share this one passage. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in this flesh, in the natural, in the physical, the life I live now, the life you and I live now, if you are a follower of Christ, the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You are loved by God. That's a good place to say amen. You are loved by God. And what he does is he lives in you. The desires of the old self are things that we need to battle against and say no to if we are to live a life that gives glory to God. As a citizen of the kingdom of God, we should live like the God that we call out to, the God who loves us. Let me invite you to close your eyes and let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you, Lord God, that in your love you have made us special, part of your kingdom, part of your family, a royal priesthood. That you call us out to be light bearers at this time. Lord God, we pray that you would guide us and teach us to say no to our old self, to the desires of our heart, but say yes to you and your ways. Teach us, O Lord. To showcase your life in our lives. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There you go. Amen. Fantastic. So it's good to know, isn't it, that we've all been called out of darkness. Is that good news? That's two of you. Is it good news that we've been called out of darkness into the light? That Jesus loves you. Maybe turn to somebody and say, Jesus loves you just to encourage them. So over these next couple of minutes, I actually want to think about love. Okay, we kind of saw it in the object lesson, didn't we? We were talking about God's love. What does it mean to love? What does it mean to love your neighbor? Do you all love your neighbors? <laughs> There's some un- uncertainty there, wasn't there? If we're honest, don't we? Sometimes we have up and down relationships. But the question is, who is our neighbor. 
Who is our, our neighbor? Now, if we turn to Mark 12, 30 and 31, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So love God, love your neighbor. And did you know, and I didn't know this, but love your neighbor is actually in the Bible, not once, not twice, but nine times. It's mentioned nine times, which means it's pretty important, isn't it? It's pretty important that we learn to love one another because, of course, our neighbor is not just our neighbor at home, but our neighbor is everybody that we come into contact with. And what do they see? What do they see when they look at you? We're called as God's children. We're in his citizenship. As citizens of God is that we're his children. But it's no point just coming to church on a Sunday. We have to actually act and do it. So number one, loving your neighbor, it actually means receiving God's love because we can't love others unless we know God and love God first. It's hard to love other people if we're struggling and we don't actually know God. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 John 4.10, it says, this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son. How exciting is that? Yes, that no matter what we've done wrong, no matter what our flaws are, God loves you. Hopefully, there's smiles on your faces, okay? God loves you intimately. He, I've said it many times. He knows how many hairs are on your head. And I sometimes look at my hairbrush on a morning, and I'm thinking, how does he still know? So much hair is coming out between the plug hole, the hairbrush, and the floor. I'm thinking, I'm surprised I've got any hair left. But he loves you that much. He knows you inside out. So, yeah, we need to know that God loves us. We need to have that security within us, knowing that. Because before we can share and give out, pretty much like that can, we can be full of love. But if we're not sharing, it's no good, is it? We need to be full of God's love. You see, in John 3.16, it says, doesn't it? And we all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. He sent his son into this world for you. So we can be full of that love. So when we're full of love, loving your neighbor means acting with compassion. Are you full of compassion all the time, 24-7? Or do you get wound up? Yes? Anybody want to confess that we sometimes get wound up? I'm, shall I say, I'm an impatient driver. And uh, sometimes I'm kind of driving along and I'm thinking, you know, the accelerator's that one, please. Can you kind of put your foot on it? I need to get to A to B. You know, I need to get there. And I kind of sometimes I go, come on, I need to get there. But I need to show compassion because I don't know maybe what the driver is going through in front of me. They might be having a, ba a bad day. So it doesn't help me kind of, I don't go on the horn, don't worry, I'm not that aggressive, but it doesn't help me kind of getting wound up. What I should do is kind of pray for them and show compassion in a different way. You see, when Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? We know the story of the Good Samaritan, don't we? We know the story there. You see, it says, even those who have no love for God see the value of being good and showing love to their neighbors. How much more should we show God's love and show God's compassion to those around us? Loving your neighbor means looking out for their well-being. In 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love protects. Are you protective? Do you look out for their well-being? I don't know if you've noticed in, in lockdown, so I can be a bit of an introvert and I don't really, I've lived on my street for 44 years which is quite a long time, and I can keep myself to myself, but during lockdown, our street has got closer together, and so we look out for each other. 
if we don't see each other or there's an elderly person on the street that we haven't seen, somebody will knock on the door because we want to protect them and we want to show concern and love for them. It's important that we demonstrate that. In Philippians 2, 4, it says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. How are you showing love? How are you showing your relationship of God to other people? Are you being protective on there? Loving your neighbor means serving them. Do we like to serve? Do we like to serve? I've been cheeky recently. I'm visiting families. The invitation is there. I'm inviting myself for dinner. I was at a lovely family last night. I had a lovely dinner. Like, but are we serving each other? My door is always open. I can't cook, so bring your food with you. I can't cook. That was one of the things. But it's good to serve in different ways, isn't it? Whether it's via food. We all love food, yes? Yes, we all love food. Whether it's via... Am I going to get a cheer for this one? Gardening? No, we say I'm the only one that's into gardening here. Whether it's by cutting a grass, the lawn of somebody, or painting or decorating, or just actually picking up the phone and texting or calling somebody and saying, how are you doing? That goes a long way, doesn't it? It's looking after people's well-beings. See, God came, Jesus came to serve, to serve the lost. And we, he set the example for us. And as citizens, we need to follow the example that Jesus has set for us. Loving your neighbor means being kind, speaking kindly. How many of us heard the childhood rhyme, haven't we? Sticks and stones won't break my bones and words will never harm me. If we're honest, it's a load of rubbish, isn't it? Because words do harm us, don't they? I'm sure we've had occasions where we haven't, we haven't mean to say something or somebody said something to us and it's hurt us deep down. So think before we speak. Show acts of kindness to people. As I said before, send in a text and things like that. Just a couple more to go. Okay, Loving your neighbor means making allowances for other people. I say, I can be impatient. I can be stubborn at times, and I have to remind myself, saying, God is at the center here. Let me not kind of react the way I used to react, but let me react in love, in that we don't know what the other person is going through on that. Loving your neighbor means sharing their joys and their sorrows. Yes? How many, buddy, how many of you like good news? Yes? There's a few of you. I like good news. Yes. I get on my phone to my dad or my brother and we share. And my brother gets on the phone to me to share about my niece. We were FaceTiming this morning. We had a puppet show at 8 o'clock this morning on FaceTime. But my niece will come on and she'll say, Auntie Karen, this is what I've done this week. And she's been picking apples this week. And she'd we've gone with kindergarten. But she was so happy and joyful about it. She wanted to share with me and then she disappeared so we lasted about five minutes with her but it's the good news of sharing we want to shout it out you know if you're a Liverpool fan you shout it out don't you well, I'm a Liverpool fan so I do if you're Everton fan it's sorrow at the moment isn't it <laughs> sorry it could be sorry for Liverpool this afternoon we don't know you know on that but it's about being there for one another Romans 12 15 says rejoice with those who rejoice mourn with those who mourn it's all about building up relationships with one another we were created for relationships we were created for a relationship with God but then he wants us to create a relationship with one another because if we think of the cross the cross has two dimensions doesn't it a vertical dimensional dimension and a horizontal dimension. The vertical represents the relationship human beings have with God. The horizontal represents the relationships we have with one another. Now we can be tempted just to focus on the one. We can be tempted just to focus on our relationship with God or we can be 
we can focus on the relationship with each other. But we need both. We need to have both. You see, through worship, prayer, and study, we focus on our relationship with God. And then we can bring peace, justice, laugh, and love with one another, sharing what we have so it's overflowing. A little bit like the, the shaving cream there. It was overflowing and overflowing. Is your love of God overflowing to your friends, to your community, that they can see a difference we're going to come into worship before dr abel brings the final section but let me just leave you with this thought okay jane goodall who's an entrepreneur says this you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make do you want to make a difference in your world today do you want to share the love of God? Are you going to love your neighbor as yourself? So let's stand. We're going to worship and then Dr. Abel is going to bring the final bit.
just in that attitude before you sit down, connect yourself with the heavens. If you're a true follower of Jesus, just briefly connect yourself again with heaven. Because he's here. That kingdom is here. The power is here. The glory is here. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, just have your seat. Um, I'm going to take the last segment of the kingdom perspective this morning. Um, and I want to say thank you to Rona, thank you to Karen for setting the scene and making my job very easy. So I'm, I'm going to be emphasizing, let your light shine. Let your light shine. And I'm taking it from Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read for, uh, verse 14 to 16. And it's going to come on, from, on the screen. Matthew chapter 5. We're reading verses 14 to 16. It says, you point to yourself. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket or a bushel, the King James Version says, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they can see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others. We're talking about citizens of the kingdom of God. You see, the Bible says that God himself is light. Okay? God is light. John says so in 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. God is light. And in him there is no darkness. So, God himself is light. But the same Bible tells us, in John 8, 12, that Jesus is the light of the world. So God is light. Jesus is light. And then Jesus is telling us in Matthew 5 that we are the light. The link here is everything that Jesus does, he says, I copy my father. So his father who is the light made him the light, and then he commissioned us to be the light. So, we are light. And why has he made us to be light? Ronald read that First Peter 2. My own emphasis from that verse, First Peter 2 will be verse 9. Called you out of darkness unto his marvelous light so that you can proclaim. For those of us who are in academics, we do do citation of a lecturer or of a speaker. And when you do citation, you're talking about the person. No matter how great you are, no matter how good you are, you can never read citation of yourself. And so the lesson here is for you, you are to read citation of God. You're never to proclaim your own glory. God has not made you as light to be seen for your glory. He has made you a light to be seen for his own glory. Let's look at light. Light is sweet. Like Ronald, I'll, this, the greatest thing that scared me as a young boy was darkness. I, I just couldn't stand it. I, I will always feel like 
the end of the world is near. In fact, the only reason I was afraid of dying as a young boy is to be alone in the casket in a dark place underneath. If that wasn't the case, I wasn't really afraid of dying. Light brings sweetness into our life. Light attracts. Light chases away darkness. Light is always conspicuous. It transforms. It illuminates. One day, I, I entered a place in my, in my workplace, and somebody was working. There was no light, and they were struggling. As soon as I flicked the switch, I said, oh, thank you. Thank you. Because the presence of that light transformed the environment. So, we must let our light shine. There are, there's a lot of areas around us full of darkness. And it is the presence of our light that can transform that can bring joy, that can bring sweetness into their lives. People must see the light of God being shown in our lives, and that will bring them to understand that God has glory. The glory of God is defined by a theologian as the outshining characters of God, the goodness of God, the love of God that we have heard about this morning, his mercies, his grace, those are outshining characters of God, his righteousness, his holiness. And it is you shining the light of God that will attract people to understand those characteristics of God. So, you must let your light shine. How can we make that happen? Because I'm very, very sure that you and I, everyone who follows Christ, really want to shine their light. But how can we do it? Because we live in flesh and blood. We have issues that we deal with. We have situations that sometimes overwhelm us. But the instruction is that you must let your light shine. How can we do that? We can do it broadly in two ways. By talk or words. What you say and by your works. What you do. So by being who you are. How many of us consider that when we speak to others, we're shining the light of God. Because if you speak nicely, if you encourage someone with what you say, that's why the Bible says that let your conversations be seasoned with grace. Okay? You don't return fire for fire. You don't... We, we had mercy explained to us by Rona this morning. Your words, your, your conversations, they're filled with compassion. The way you talk to people, the way you address situation, it's a way of you shining the light of God. And of course, sharing the gospel of Christ, witnessing to people about the love of God that you have enjoyed, that you have experienced, that's how you can, by your words, shine the light of Jesus Christ. But there's another way of shining that light, by what you do. By being there. By being compassionate in your action. Can you go the extra mile? Can you lay down your life for your friends? Not necessarily literally, but in what you do. 
do you have good deeds? Can people point to you the good deeds you are doing that will attract them to Jesus Christ? Somebody says that if you are arrested as a Christian, do they have enough evidence to prosecute you? That you're really a Christian? Or would they say, well, we're not really sure. We can't prosecute you because it doesn't really stand up well that you are a Christian. That's how you will shine your light. As I round up this morning, I just want to mention three things that we need to do to really allow the light of Christ to shine in us. The very first thing is to fear God. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is a thread of evil. Pride and arrogance are the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Fear God. What does it mean to fear God? The Bible makes it clear. Shun evil. But other, apart from that, we're talking about reference fear of God, not to, not to be thinking of God as somebody who is coming with a big whip against you. No, but fearing God brings humility into light in your life. You recognize the authority, the majesty, the greatness of God, and in response to that, you pattern your life with humility. Knowing that the Bible says one day you will give an account of yourself to God. So, fear God. If the fear of God is not in you, you will have no respect for people. You will treat people anyhow. You will relate anyhow. So, I want to plead with you by Christ's name. Learn to fear God. Let the fear of God be in you. That's one of the ways you can let your light shine. The second thing is focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't have time to unpack that, but I just want to bring something out there. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of your faith. Focus on him. When you focus on him, you will have example of how to live. Jesus has been in every situation of life that you could be today. And yet the Bible says without sin. So he set you example. Look unto Jesus. Our God was the guy who said this and he became something that we begin to talk more about in Christian circles. During the time of the election in America when there was this great dispute between him and George Bush. They went to court. They, they did one thing after another, another. And then he came around and people were still pushing him to keep insisting that he would not accept the final result. But he said this, what will Jesus do? WWJD. What will Jesus do. Please apply that to every circumstances and situation of your, of your life. Focusing on Jesus. What will Jesus do in this? Would Jesus react like this? Would Jesus speak like this? Would Jesus walk away? Or would Jesus stand by? So, focus on Jesus. And the last point, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, or the King James says as in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
You and I cannot do anything on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. A, a Christian that is victorious is a Christian that is constantly filled with the Spirit of God. So, every day, invite the Spirit of God into your life. Ask for his guidance, but also ask for his empowerment. The, Jesus says, when I leave, I will give you a comforter, referring to the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things, but also he will guide you in all things. So, you, and you can see on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, timid Peter became one of the greatest evangelists. That is what the Holy Spirit can do for you and in you. So, fear God, focus on Jesus, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the Godhead living in you. That's how you can imbibe God, and then you will shine the light of God. I pray that the Lord will help us. Because today is Family Sunday and we have children here, there is a song I want the children to sing with me. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. No matter how little, light transforms as long as you allow it to shine. Okay? One, two. I, I don't know how to do action, sorry. <laughs> This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. Amen. Can we just rise up and connect ourselves with the Holy Spirit, with the Godhead, focus on Jesus? And don't just sing that song for fun, but tell God you mean it and that he will help you to let your light shine. Father, we... Thank you for this morning, for what you have taught us from your words. We're kingdom people. We're citizens of heaven. It has pleased you, and we thank you for that, to call each one of us out of darkness onto your marvelous light, so that we can show forth your glory. I just pray that none of us will be a waste of space in the kingdom of God. Our light will not become darkness or dim, but we will let it shine. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, next week, we have what is traditionally known as all souls where we will be taking time to remember our loved one who have passed away. We will do that in prayers and in reflection. So please come prepare. And also, as a relationship to that, we're going to start the bereavement journey again. You remember Pastor Greg took some series of teaching on how to deal with bereavement, and we're going to start that again from the second or the 9th of November. So, pray. Especially if you know people who are going through tough time of bereavement right now. You can invite them so that they can actually enjoy the peace and the presence of God that is available here. God bless you and see you next week.
darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord oh it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only sing great are you lord you give life and you give life
your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Ooh, and great are you, As we go through our week, so we just sing this one more time. That's his breath in our lungs. And it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. pray that you have a great week, a joy-filled week. May God's face shine upon you as we go from this place. Amen. Once again, it's been such a delight to be able to share together as a church this morning. And uh, we know uh, that taking what God has been doing in our lives, we can go and have wonderful weeks with him. Just to um, invite you um, to journey together with one another as we go through the week. We as a church, we don't just gather, but we get going into what God has for us together. And we have these things called transform communities. We would love to help you to connect with other like-minded people who are exploring God's goodness and grace and seeing how they can be a part of his transforming work in the world. So again, hit us up, get in touch. We'd love to help you to connect. Anything that you need, any prayer requests, do let us know. And we'll love to see you again this time next week. God bless you and bye for now.